Hey, I'm Jonathan Herrera, and I am here talking to you from my studio in Oakland, California, Dime Studios. Uh, I want to tell you about this new bass that I have in my hands here. It's the Nordstrand Audio Asininix bass. And uh, if you're at all a bass nerd or, or geek of any uh, fashion, you've probably heard of this instrument. It's uh, being buzzed about more than I can remember uh, a new bass release in a while. And um, in my opinion, there's a good reason. So uh, my, my purpose here today is to play as many of the sounds of it as I can and record them in a high quality way so you can really get a sense there at home uh, what it sounds like and decide if it's right for you. Um, first, I want to tell you a little bit about the instrument. So essentially, this all begins with a uh, somewhat rare late 60s Italian bass by a company called Goya. And that bass was the Panther. And if you go Google Panther, or actually I'll stick a thumbnail somewhere up here uh, so you can take a look at it. You'll notice that in a, in a kind of general way, if you squint, the Asininix and the Panther look alike. Uh, there's a reason for that. And it all begins with um, Juan Alderete. He um, was... Uh, a big fan of this Goya Panther bass. I think Josh Klinghoffer, the LA-based uh, guitar player and bass player, had turned him on to it. And um, so Juan went looking for one, found one, and at some point Juan went out to uh, Carrie Nordstrand's shop in Southern California, in Redlands, California, with his Goya for, for Carrie to take a look because he was excited about this new bizarre uh, collectible bass he got. Carrie checked out the bass, was impressed with the sound, as I think most people are who come across them, um, but noticed that like a lot of basses of that era, it, its design and construction left something to be desired. Just some outright bizarre choices. Uh, for example, on the Goya, because they had four tuners in line and it was a narrow headstock, the G string actually rubs against the tuning post of the D string on its way to the tuner. So that's weird. Uh, also the switching, the pickup switching system, which was buttons, um, was mechanical in operation. So there was actually behind the button buried in the control cavity were levers and other sort of push rods and things that um, inevitably are going to break and, and often are broken on uh, if you find a Goya Panther now. So Kerry saw this. Um, at the same time, Kerry is, uh, had been considering um, what he would do next for a new base model. He'd really focused a lot of his energy and attention into his, uh, his great pickups and preamps, um, but was, of course, always, you know, began as a luthier and, and would occasionally make, you know, pretty expensive uh, one-off boutique uh, bases, mostly Fender-style bases, but wanted to do something else and particularly was interested in opening up uh, an import business where he would have a, a factory overseas uh, handle the construction of the instrument and then do the quality control back at his shop in the U.S. With CNC manufacturing, computer numerically controlled manufacturing, essentially automated manufacturing, the quality of instruments you get from um, factories, uh, mostly in Asia, is pretty extraordinary. I mean, when I was at Bass Player Magazine, uh, I was really there at the kind of dawn of this revolution in bass manufacturing and watched it mature to the point where we would be getting bases that were made in China, Indonesia, Vietnam, Korea, and uh, they were pretty difficult to fault. Um, and again, this is due to the uh, really strict quality control of some of those companies and the uh, precision of CNC manufacturing. So this is all stuff that's interesting to, to business owners in, in the industry because it allows them to price their instruments lower, make them more accessible, uh, and also entertain um, interesting new ideas and scale up production in ways that a small shop, for example, like Carrie's, uh, might have a hard time doing. So all of this was kind of stewing within him. And then he sees this bass, Juan comes over and a light bulb goes off. And he says, you know, I think I could do something like this, but improve it, modernize it, make it durable and, and reliable in a way that only kind of a modern manufacturing point of view could do. That's where this comes from. So that's the genesis of this. And it is meant to evoke in important ways the Goya, particularly the sound. Um, the, the, the most sort of notable feature about it is it's a 30.7 inch scale, uh, which is short. It's, I guess, traditionally a short scale would be 30 even, although I think there was probably some uh, variety there. But uh, 
This is um, just under 31 inches, so short scale. Um, also quite narrow neck, so it's just a very approachable instrument from a playability and ergonomics point of view. It's very light, under seven pounds. Um, has a pair of custom wound for this instrument single coil pickups that were based on what Kerry could sort of reverse engineer from the Goya pickups. And um, interestingly, it only has one knob, for volume and all of the pickup switching and tone shaping is happening via these buttons here on the top and there are two pairs of four each the buttons by the way are the same buttons that uh, universal audio and, and ure back in the day used for the famous studio standard 1176 compressor so these are time tested Buttons. I mean, there's still many of those original Ure 1176s in service in studios with the original buttons. These are very durable. Um, so I'm not concerned at all about the, the long-term prospects of these. Um, but it's actually kind of an ingenious system. Yes, it does pay homage to the Panther, but it, and because it also had buttons. Uh, but these are, you know, they're physical switches, but they are electronic. Um, they're buttons, I, I mean, but the uh, switching is going on electronically. Um, and they enable you to do a pretty substantial variety of sounds. Um, on this, this group of buttons here is for pickup switching. There is a blended mode, which is these, this button um, furthest toward the, the headstock. Neck soloed, bridge soloed. There's actually an off button, which is cool. And then there's a secret mode, which uh, is a bit of a tribute to the 1176 compressor that from which these buttons came. And that compressor famously, when you push all the, it's kind of an accidental feature of the 1176. When you push all the, the compression ratio buttons in, you get this really high ratio, you know, of infinity to one kind of limiting ratio. It's kind of the, the uh, if you really want to slam something or slam a drum set or really make it explosive, that's, that's your setting on the compressor. By the same token, when you press all the buttons in on the Asininix, the um, pickups are wired in series. So these are single coil pickups that become uh, series wired sort of humbucker when paired and uh, that's different from the blended position on its own which is a parallel wired so this is definitely kind of the most massive you know when you wire single coil pickups in series you get more output you get a bigger sound uh, these are the uh, tone shaping uh, buttons and there's a flat setting a uh, low pass so a high frequency roll off uh, at a certain cutoff fairly high um, probably somewhere in the upper mids, and then a even deeper cutoff, so a low pass filter with a lower cutoff frequency, and then there's a mid-range notch filter. So between the four pickup settings and the four tone settings, there's an actually surprisingly amount of variety in this instrument, which I'm looking forward to letting you check out. Um, other things to note about it, it's very, very well constructed from good stuff. The hardware is all hip shot. This is a, a custom hip shot bridge. Um, with a kind of uh, that quick system where you can just put the ball end of the string in without having to thread it out. Uh, hip shop tuners with lollipop style um, heads, which is cool. And uh, three bolt neck. You don't really need more than that because there's not a ton of tension on this neck relative to uh, what you might expect. Uh, maple neck, rosewood fingerboard, alder body. It's available in a variety of very cool colors. And at the moment, it is, uh, I believe, $839, $839, and um, comes, at least for now, with one of Carrie's really cool Nordy Mutes, which is a way to, uh, which is like a piece of neoprene with some wood on it that allows you to mute the string. So, um, oh, also, big fan of these, the, the spoke wheel truss rod adjustment, which is infinitely more convenient I don't, than trying to find the right size Allen wrench and, or, God forbid, taking the neck off. I wish everybody did that. But uh, pretty straightforward instrument. So I'm gonna go through all of the sounds now. So every possible combination, and I'll indicate what setting we're in so you can get a really good sense of how this sounds.